threats against me personally, against our home, against our children. My husband actually had to remove our children from our home for a week when I was involved in the issue of marriage being defined as one man, one woman. We didn't go out in public. We didn't tell people what was going on because we didn't want to fan the flames. But right now, I, it is my opinion that what is, be, what is happening is a concerted effort to silence you. That's what's happening. We're not going quietly. We are not going quietly. President Obama took his jacket off, rolled up his sleeves, went to Iowa, was, uh, was all happy and talking about how thrilled he was about passing this health care bill. And they want you to believe that everyone feels the same way too. Well, after the bill passed, a poll was taken, 59% of the American people do not want this health care bill. We are in the overwhelming majority. And when we found out that Speaker Pelosi was scheduling the bill to be voted on on Sunday, here it is in the Easter season during Lent, we do not vote on bills on Sundays, but she scheduled the vote on the Sabbath. In my opinion, this was an action of profaning the Sabbath to have people in the chamber voting on a bill which for the first time in the history of this country would provide for federal funding of abortion, the most expansive funding of abortion since the passage of Roe versus Wade. This is absolutely massive. And she was about to force pro-life Democrats to vote against and violate their own moral conscience and to force Americans to violate our moral conscience to have to pay for other people's abortions, to do this on, a, on the Sabbath. And we decided, we thought about that, about what that meant to force members of Congress to do that. So we got together and we decided we would do something too, because we have election certificates too. Mm. And so we decided that for the first time in 130 years, we as members of Congress would hold a church service inside the Capitol on Sunday. to have the church service in Statuary Hall, the first place, the, actually the largest church in, in Washington, D.C. at the time. Church services were held for years, by the way. Um, let's go back to separation of church and state, if you will. The issue with the First Amendment, Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration of Independence, made it his practice every Sunday to attend church inside the Capitol. James Madison, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, our founders every week uh, met for church in Statuary Hall and then when the rotunda was built, they held it in the rotunda because it was larger and it held 1,500 people. And whether it was a Catholic priest or a Protestant minister, church services were held for years on a regular basis until 130 years ago. And last Sunday, we, we broke that barrier and again held a church service. We invited Father Frank Pavone of Priests for Life to come and deliver a homily to us. We had a Protestant lay pastor, a Democrat, deliver a, a Protestant message. We sing three hymns, our God, O oh God, our help in ages past, our help in days to come, America the beautiful and amazing grace. And we had testimonies given of what Jesus Christ has meant in the lives of members of Congress. There were over 150 people that were present in Statuary Hall. It was one of the most delightful experiences I've had because we decided that we were going to dedicate that day to Jesus Christ. And I gave you the good news that we all 
already are winning back Washington. We have the American people on our side. They are fired up or over this health care bill. They do not want it. They will want it less every day going toward November because this is not going to bring a lot of positives. This is going to be bringing, unfortunately, negatives into our lives, and I'll be sharing with you a little bit of what that is. But what we have now is the fire and the energy to go forward to take not only the seat that uh, was formerly occupied by Byron Dorgan in North Dakota, but also that of the state representative, who, by the way, was, was had, who helped to explode the myth of the pro-life Democrats serving in Washington, D.C. There were 12 uh, supposedly pro-life Democrats who came last Sunday. If only five of those pro-life Democrats would have held we would not have had Obamacare today. If only five, if only Earl Pomeroy had been willing to be one of those five, if only Jim Overstar of Minnesota had been, been willing to be one of those five, Bart Stupak of Michigan, who was going to walk the plank until the final hour, if only he had held strong. If only Loretta Sanchez, who told me privately she was going to vote against the bill, had held strong. If only one more Democrat had been willing to be pro-life, perhaps Tim Walls in southern Minnesota, if only one more, that would have been enough. And we wouldn't have had this an abomination of a bill. Heck, if only five had held out. Well, Bart Stupak said twice on Sunday that Nancy Pelosi told him that she had the votes. So it, 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 the jig was up. She had the votes. And so the best he could do was to get an executive order from the president that would enforce the Stupak language. And so he said, well, I guess we lost. I guess we're done. So I guess this is the deal that I better strike. Everyone told him, Bart, don't do it. Don't listen. As a matter of fact, if he would have only listened to Ronald Reagan's advice, trust, but verify. And had Bart Stupak sat with the Stupak 12 in the seats and watched the electronic board and watched the votes go up, he would have known that he was had and that she did not have the votes. She didn't. She bluffed her way into getting those votes. And what we learned is that when it came to Bart Stupak and when it came to Earl Pomeroy and when it came to Jim Oberstar and the other so-called mythical pro-life Democrats, of which there aren't any anymore, when, what we learn is that party was more important than principle. That their pro-life credentials, when they were really needed in the clutch, meant absolutely nothing. And so that's, that's when you find out that's when you find out what someone is made of. What are they going to sell out for? What are they going to get? And I think you're going to find out information about Earl Pomeroy and, and the other ones and what they got and what the deals were. And it's not a very pretty sight, is it? It's not a pretty sight. Especially not when you understand what it is that we're looking at. This morning, I read an article in the St. Paul Pioneer Press. And I know I'll never be able to get through all that I wanted to tell you about, but I'll try and do as much as I can without keeping you too long. This is the St. Paul Pioneer Press. It said, firms total up costs of health care changes. We, this bill hasn't even been signed. By the way, I was told that President Obama signed the health care bill on Tuesday, which was the anniversary of Patrick Henry's Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech. That is our clarion call. And I think it is fortuitous that it was that day that he gave that speech. He may sign that legislation, but again, we lost that battle. We are not going to win this war, and I'll tell you why. After that vote came through, after that vote came through on Sunday night, I turned to Mike Pence, our Republican uh, conference leader on the floor, and I said, Mike, we have to file a repeal bill, and we have to file a discharge petition. We have to do that right away. He said, Michelle, go for it. 